Welcome back, folks, and on to Chapter 6, a discussion of public opinion, political socialization, and the media. And here are our learning outcomes for the week. We'll define public opinion, consensus, and divided opinion. We'll identify major sources of political socialization. We'll outline the characteristics of a scientific opinion poll and problems pollsters face in obtaining accurate results. We'll identify the different types of media and the changing roles media play in American society. It will analyze political bias in the media and the impact of the media on our politics and campaigns. All right, let's dig into some concepts related to public opinion and political socialization. First of all, there are many publics to study out there. We could be, in many cases, when we look at public opinion polls, they relate to an upcoming election and we're trying to measure um, likely voters or registered voters. That's the public that we want to study. But we could also be studying female voters. We could be studying male voters. We could be studying voters with a college education. So there are a lot of publics out there that we might want to study. Uh, when we're looking at public attitudes, when we're looking at public opinion, in some cases there's consensus on issues, and we see that in public opinion polling. There is agreement. And in other areas, public opinion is very divided. And I think you can probably think of examples of that, like how people feel about, say, abortion rights or um, how people think about immigration, whether or not it should be expanded or restricted. How we get our attitudes about politics is a process known as political socialization. We've already explored this a little bit in the class. Um, our family, the family is a fundamental area of political socialization. Uh, we weren't born little Democrats or little Republicans. We were socialized into these attitudes. Um, so family is very important. <clears throat> Early education, um, religious organizations, things like that also have a very um, early and pronounced view on our political attitudes. But education too, over the course of our lives, whether that be K through 12 education, college, graduate school, those are gonna influence our political attitudes in, uh, in, in many ways. Peer groups are also important, um, peer groups when we're younger, but also uh, professions, work groups, whether or not we're a member of a union, these are also gonna influence how we see um, the world politically. And opinion leaders, opinion leaders locally, that could be the youth pastor, that could be a teacher, um, and uh, more prominent opinion leaders that I think many might come to mind, like the President of the United States or a talk show radio host or somebody like that. Political culture is a society's attitudes in general about the role of government um, and politics. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's in many cases a generalization, but I think we can you know, come up with some generalizations about what American political culture is like. There's a, um, you know, a high premium on the value of liberty, equality, um, uh, your uh, rights to seek wealth or property. These are important parts about uh, of American culture, and you might not see them to the same degree uh, in other societies around the world. Also, like how trusting are we of our government? Our institutions. So this gets into the term political trust. It's really hard to get anything done if people think everything is a sham or everything is corrupt. Um, and that's particularly problematic. If people don't think their vote matters, why would they participate in an election process? Um, if they don't have any trust in policing, would they turn to a police officer uh, to, deal with a, to deal with a problem? So these are all issues related to uh, political culture and the role of how do we trust these institutions or is there a lack of trust in these institutions? Many political scientists argue that um, the media is starting to rival the family when it comes to the impact on our political socialization. Media is a much bigger part of our life, particularly uh, new media, Facebook, um, other forms of social media, Twitter, um, satellite media, other internet sources, um, traditional television. These are all things that are a bigger part of our lives than we would have seen in previous generations. So um, again, there's an argument that the role 
with regard to media in influencing our political socialization is increasing. Um, some general things that we see when it comes to what's impacting um, public opinion with regard to the media. Uh, one is that in some cases we do tend to see a generational effect. So for those people who went through the Great Depression, that influenced their view of the role of government later on. Um, people who experienced and went through Watergate and um, Nixon's forced resignation, the Vietnam War and the fact that the Johnson administration was not being honest with the American public about the progress of that war. Those two things together led to a really precipitous decline in um, trust toward our national institutions. So we still haven't recovered from them. It will be interesting if the current crises that we're facing as a country right now, the COVID epidemic, uh, the protests with regard to the Floyd killing and um, police brutality, you know, are these substantial enough crises to, to lead to a generational um, effect when it comes to public opinion? We'll see. All right. Well, we don't want to overgeneralize. We don't want to stereotype, but there is a measurable influence of demographic factors on uh, voting behavior, on ideology. So let's discuss that a little bit. Uh, educational achievement, whether or not somebody has a college degree or not. Historically, Republicans did better um, with those can uh, with voters that had a, a four-year degree. This changed in 2016. I don't know whether that's a one-off or not. Uh, President Trump did not do particularly well when it comes to voters with a college degree, but he did better with more poorly educated voters, so that uh, that made up for it. Economic status is also something that has historically been pretty predictive. Republicans did better with people who were of higher socioeconomic status. Um, Democrats did better with folks that were of lower socioeconomic status, and that was in rural America, but also it was in urban America too. This has changed, and um, we saw that uh, in 2016, President Trump did pretty well with groups of lower economic status, particularly in rural America. Um, religious and religious commitment. This is an area that we see as more predictive than ever. Um, if you were to ask me in, I don't know, uh, 1975, um, you know, what was the impact on religion and partisanship? I would say, well, probably not that much. Um, you know, if you were an evangelical Christian, that really wouldn't tell me whether or not you were a Democrat or a Republican. Now it gives us a pretty good idea. Those people who self-identify as evangelical uh, Christians are much more likely to identify as Republicans. Um, those people who attend church regularly are much more likely to identify as Republicans. Those people who don't attend or attend much more sporadically are much more likely to associate with the Democratic Party. Now, an exception to this is within the African-American community, which tends to attend church at a higher rate than um, the national average and, and also within the Hispanic community as well. So there are some pretty big exceptions there. But in general, religion and uh, religious commitment is highly predictive when it comes to um, ideology and, um, and voter preferences. Race and ethnicity, African-Americans since FDR have supported the Democratic Party at a pretty high rate. I think Hillary Clinton got around 88% of the African-American vote, although the African-American turnout wasn't as high, obviously, as it was under Obama. So there is some uh, it's a close association with that. Um, the Hispanic population perhaps is not as uh, committed to the Democratic Party, and you do see segments of the Hispanic population that's much more closely associated with the Republican Party, as Cubans have been historically much more supportive of the Republican Party um, because American Cubans in many cases are fleeing Castro, fleeing communist, communism in the 1950s. We see a much more pronounced gender gap since 1980. Before that, we didn't really see that. We saw families much more voting as a unit since women got the right to vote in 1920. Uh, but beginning in the 1980s, beginning with Ronald Reagan's time in office, we start to see a much more pronounced um, gap between men and women when it comes to uh, voting behavior. Uh, women are much more likely to support Democratic candidates. 
uh, men are much more likely to support Republican candidates on average. Women are much more likely to support abortion rights and much more likely to support um, ending capital punishment, the death penalty. So we now measure some pretty clear differences between men and women. Of course, these are generalizations. <clears throat> And geographic region. This was also something that um, was not all that predictive a generation or two ago. There were Northern Republicans and there were Southern Democrats a generation ago. There were Northern Democrats and there were Southern Republicans, you know. And uh, today, geographic region, red and blue states, if you're from the state of New York as a, uh, you know, prominent political figure who's running a statewide campaign, you know, to be successful, the chances are that you're going to be a Democrat. Uh, likewise, if you're going to win a statewide election in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia, um, you're much more likely to be a conservative. You're much more likely to be a Republican. So we've seen the country break up into so-called red and blue states. So geography is becoming more important. Right. Public opinion is obviously important in democracies. If we were in North Korea right now or a totalitarian state, public opinion is not nearly as important, but we're a representative democracy. We have elections. Public opinion matters. But public opinion isn't everything. Politicians respond to mobilize public opinion. They respond to when the public is really willing to get out, to vote on an issue, to demonstrate, and that sort of stuff. You know, If you ask people whether or not they support deficit spending, most say they don't. Uh, but they also don't support increased taxes or fewer benefits. So um, public opinion isn't the only factor. Uh, are people really willing to take action on this? With the demonstrations in, in Minnesota and across the country regarding George Floyd's killing and police brutality, we're seeing real mobilized public opinion. And the result of that has been changes in public policy, or at least the beginnings of changes of public policy all across the country. Now we'll see whether or not that's enduring. So public opinion matters, but are people really, really willing to take action? So how do we measure public opinion? Well, there's a few ways. Public opinion polls, which we'll mostly talk about, uh, surveys, which are much more in depth, you know, at the end of this class, you'll fill out a survey about what you thought about the class. That'll be much more detailed. Uh, probably the vast majority of you won't fill it out, uh, but that'd be a more detailed instrument. And then there are focus groups when you get a small group together and you can really dive into things. How do you feel about this political slogan? How do you feel about this particular political candidate and, and really dive into it? So I do want you to understand those. I know the reading deals much more with opinion polls, but there are other ways of measuring public opinion as well. Modern public opinion polling dates back to World War II, to the 1940s, um, and certainly techniques have improved quite a bit since then. The most, the most critical aspect when it comes to public opinion polling is that whatever population that you're seeking to study Anyone that you call for a public opinion poll to, to ask what their views are, they need to have an they need to be randomly selected from the population you want to study. So if you're looking at registered voters in the United States and you're calling 2,000 people as part of your opinion poll, all reg registered voters in the United States should have an equal chance of being contacted. It should be truly random, and then you can project the outcome of that um, and with some accuracy. Now, we know that can't be perfect. Um, and so the difference between the population that you're studying and the entire population uh, that you're looking at, that's what we refer to as, as sampling error. Now, as you might imagine, there is several areas that make it difficult to obtain um, accurate results when it comes to public opinion polling. Um, for example, women are much more likely to pick up the phone than men. Okay, so you might find in... If you're selecting 2,000 people to conduct a public opinion poll on uh, for registered voters about who you're going to support in the upcoming election, you might find that, I don't know, 70% of the respondents are women. Well, you know that 70% of the population you're studying are not women. So you may need to weight one part of it, uh, provide more weight to those male respondents, for example. And those decisions and how you do that, that's referred to as house effects, like Whatever organization is conducting the poll is going to have different strategies. Um, 
And that's why you see some differences. You could have two public opinion polls that are conducted by two different universities on the very same day, and they could have different results because there's going to be different, um, different uh, decisions made by the organization. Now, we can actually determine the accuracy here because we have elections, right? So we look at public opinion polls right before the election, and we look at the election itself. And we can certainly find periods where there are errors. Um, but, you know, in many cases, they're pretty close. So if you look, you know, yes, many people were surprised that Hillary Clinton lost to uh, President Trump in 2016. Uh, but she did win the national po uh, popular vote by 2%. Uh, I think the average for public opinion polls of the election was 4% her favor. Uh, she ended up winning by 2%, but of course lost in the Electoral College. That's pretty darn close. So if you have razor thin elections, you don't really want to look at public opinion polls as well. It's definitely going to go this way or that way. Um, and of course, the Electoral College in the United States provides additional weight to uh, more sparsely populated rural and in many cases more conservative states. So there's an inherent Republican advantage to the Electoral College as it's, as, as it's currently um, constructed. There are obvious pros and cons when it comes to public opinion uh, polling. It does bring out voices that wouldn't be heard otherwise. You know, it gets to the individual rather than, than the elites, rather than leadership. And it also keeps politicians in touch with their constituents. However, there are clear problems, right? Questions can be biased. People sometimes will give an uneducated opinion rather than admit they don't have an opinion. So in many cases, if you start asking who people support for an upcoming presidential election, they will often say the person with the highest level of name recognition. They might not have put a lot of thought into it yet. Okay, let's shift to a discussion of the roles of the media in the United States. Of course, high up on that list is entertaining the public, but also reporting the news. In either case, both cases, um, a fundamental goal for media organizations is making money. Most of our media organizations in the United States are for-profit entities, and there are some exceptions, obviously, national public radio or public television, things like that. When it comes to reporting the news, you know, how does the media identify public problems? Uh, a key power of the news media is the ability to set the agenda. You know, what do they talk about? What do they not talk about? So a good quote from the text, I think, is, you know, um, media organizations, you know, they don't brainwash you. They don't tell you what to think, but they certainly tell you what to think about. They set the agenda. Um, the issue of priming, you know, what, what, what do we look at? What do we ignore? Framing, what, what story do we tell? You know, do we tell the story about a police officer that abused their power? Or do we tell a story about a police officer that is uh, building connections within their community? What story do we tell? And is that story reflective of reality? So there, that, that kind of gets into the issue of framing. Um, an issue with all those things is that we tend to turn to those news sources that, that reflect our existing views. This gets into the idea of reinforcement. So if we're conservative, we turn to maybe talk radio or Fox News and our opinions get more uh, get reinforced and um, more strongly associated with that organization. If people are more on the liberal end of the spectrum, they're getting their news from MSNBC or they're getting their news from CNN. And those attitudes are being reinforced. They're being galvanized. Um, so make sure that you understand those concepts. As I mentioned before, the role of the media when it comes to socializing is increasing. People are spending more of their time interacting with media, whether that be social media, new media, or more traditional media like television um, and uh, entertainment programming. Um, we see organizations like Twitter and Facebook providing a new political forum um, than, than we've seen in the past. I've talked about the role of, of profits when it comes to media. But keep in mind, you know, it's the number one goal of media organizations is to raise money. And that's either to sell their product or it's to sell advertising. And you don't do that by being boring. You do that by being sensational. And so in many cases, you will see an attempt to uh, make things perhaps more dramatic. And sometimes um, that means making our political rivals evil or our enemies. Um, uh, that creates more drama. 
And in many cases, though, unfortunately, it creates a more toxic political environment. We've also seen a real financial crisis in the American media with regard to newspapers. Newspapers are finding it hard to succeed. They're finding it hard to sell ads. This is going to be even more the case, I'm sure, after the um, the epidemic and, and uh, virus lockdowns and, and so forth. So the survival of actual printed newspapers are, is certainly in doubt. Now, in many cases, their online component can be doing quite well, but even then, you know, they tend to struggle in competition with new media. Though in many cases, they're struggling financially. There's still a, a substantial impact of traditional media broadcast media newspapers. Fewer and fewer people are subscribing to newspapers, or at least the print version of them, uh, but they remain, the newspapers themselves remain important political players. They uh, endorse candidates. They have uh, editorials. Um, they're covering state and local news, and that's one of the reasons why I encourage you to read newspapers, because decision makers are reading newspapers, whether that be online or in a traditional form. <clears throat> of course, we've seen since the 1950s, a transition to TV journalism where many people are getting their news. And that's changed how people digest the news. And, and um, you know, people look at much uh, shorter segments. They see segments that are um, much more dramatic in nature. Sometimes short sound bites carry the day versus much more detailed explanations of issues or concerns. Some of this I've already explored. We obviously see new patterns of media consumption through Facebook, Twitter, still see a continuing influence of television to a lesser extent newspapers. Some trends that we see in media as a whole. Well, first of all, as I mentioned before, media is highly commercialized. Um, it is about turning a profit and um, news organizations and media organizations long ago realized that there was a lot of money to be made through the news business. Uh, we're seeing media consolidation, so big companies like Disney or um, Comcast or whatever will own um, a number of media organizations, and they're kind of under one corporate umbrella. At the same time that these organizations are, are owned by these large corporate entities, we as media consumers are going to a much more fragmented media environment. So it used to be maybe you watch the TV news at the national news at 530 in the evening and the whole country was getting their news from three network sources, right? ABC, NBC, uh, CBS. Um, now that's not the case. Our media landscape is much more fragmented. People are going to Fox, they're going to CNN, they're going to MSNBC, they're going to um, uh, the traditional broadcast networks. And that means that, you know, we're getting, a, we're all getting a much different story about what's happening in the world. And if we're conservative, we're going to conservative sources. And if we're liberal, we're going to liberal sources. Whereas if you were watching the national news in the evening, in the 1950s, you and most of your neighbors were getting similar information. That's one of the reasons why, um, you know, we've become more fragmented politically because our sort, media sources are so fragmented. Also, our media is globalized, and in many cases, that globalization is centered in the United States. So the United States is not just supplying media to itself, but we're exporting media around the world. And uh, whether that be our movies, would that, that be television? Right now, somebody in Uzbekistan is watching a Friends rerun, you know, for example. CNN is broadcasted around the world. So we're exporting media. People are consuming our media around the world, and they're getting attitudes about the United States based on the media that we export. Um, some challenges facing the modern media. The Internet is fairly unregulated. Should that be the case? Should it be regulated more as a um, sort of a... Uh, uh, national resource that needs to be managed more centrally. This kind of is related to the idea of net neutrality. Under Obama, there was efforts to make sure internet service providers were not giving preferential access to those um, media sources that they had a relationship. So Comcast might be tempted to make it easier to access NBC material because they own NBC, for example. Um, but under President Trump, net neutrality, as enforced by the FCC, was reversed. We're still not exactly sure what that's going to mean, but should um, net access and service providers be neutral with their content or should they be allowed to 
give preferential treatment uh, to certain um, entities if they've got a business interest with them. And of course, there's the issue of foreign governments and the role that um, China, Russia, and other groups that seek to influence social media and seem to influence American public opinion and our elections. Uh, how do we regulate that? All right, let's explore the relationship between political campaigns and media. Um, obviously, we need to go through the media to follow uh, particularly national political campaigns. It's unlikely that we're going to get a chance to hear directly from presidential candidates. So we have to turn to the news media. We have to turn to new media and social media um, for information. Historically, political advertising has been very important when it comes to presidential elections and most money that a campaign spent would be on political advertising. And that may continue to be the case, although President Trump was dramatically outspent by Hillary Clinton in 2016 and obviously won the election. And he did so by taking his message directly to voters, directly through social media, directly through Twitter. And so it may be that uh, at least traditional political advertising is not as important as it was. Although targeted political advertising, where you're able to directly target, it, target supporters or persuadable voters, um, that is becoming more important. How campaigns manage news coverage? How do they spin it? How do they respond to it? Again, in this area, President Trump um, taking his message directly to voters and bypassing traditional media sources made it that um, they just simply chose not to interact with the traditional media gatekeepers. Presidential debates have historically been um, important when it comes to selecting candidates. And in many cases, the candidate that most voters perceive to have uh, won the election ends up winning the elect uh, won the debate end up winning the election this is another area where the 2016 election seems to be a departure most people who looked at those debates saw uh, clinton come out on top and yet um, president trump obviously won the election won a very close election um, president obama in 2008 really revolutionized fundraising for political campaigns and you know, raised hundreds of millions of dollars online. And so in that case, there was real innovation in the Obama uh, campaign. In 2016, there was a great deal of innovation, as I already mentioned before, but the ability of President Trump to bypass traditional media sources and take his message directly to voters, even though he didn't do as much fundraising um, as President uh, Obama or Clinton did uh, via the internet. And I think I've already explored how President Trump effectively used uh, social media in uh, 2016 and continues to today. Okay, let's uh, briefly touch on bias in the media. First, let's drill down on the concept of bias. Some people uh, will call something biased if it's if a news item is inaccurate. Um, others will say, well, it blows something out of proportion. And others still will claim bias anytime there's a news item that is unfavorable to their candidate or their party or their ideology. Um, so, you know, the term bias is thrown around pretty broadly. There's, a, you know, almost it's taken as a given that there's a liberal bias in the American media, but the story is a lot more complex than that. Talk, talk radio in the United States is widely listened to, almost entirely conservative. Fox News is the most watched cable uh, uh, news network. It clearly has a conservative bent. Um, the major newspapers like the uh, New York Post, the uh, Washington, uh, the Wall Street Journal, these have um, conservative editorial pages. But many of you know the the nation's newspaper of record certainly has a liberal editorial page in the New York Times, and then we often associate CNN. MSNBC as, as being more um, favorable to Democrats. And that perhaps is an issue we're seeing across the board is that um, news media has become more ideolog ideologically driven, um, more opinion-based, less straight news, um, more sensational and so forth. So that's something I think that we're seeing you know, across the board. Um, but, you know, as you explore media and as you're t taking in stories, you know, ask yourself, is this accurate? Can I verify the accuracy? There's a number of nonpartisan uh, organizations that engage in fact checking. And just because a story is negative about a candidate, again, that doesn't 
um, necessarily mean that it's being that it's being driven by bias. I mean, you know, one could argue that um, you know reporting early reporting of the Holocaust during World War II, um, you know, someone could look at that and say, hey, this is demonstrating an anti-German bias. Of course, we realized that was one of, if not the major stories and um, um, great tragedies of World War II. Um, so, you know, in many cases, something is accurate and it um, paints a candidate or an entity, or in this case, a country in an incredibly negative light. But, um, but the facts lead us to where they are. Um, so sometimes news media that just simply says, well, on one hand this and on one hand that. Some people think the world's round. Some people think the world's flat. We have quotes from both sides. Um, that's media that doesn't really uh, do much for us. So uh, there is a analysis component to, to media. Of course, all this makes for uh, difficulty in determine accuracy sometimes. And again, it's one of the reasons why we, uh, why we study these things. Okay, to summarize, public opinion is the combined attitudes or beliefs shared by some portion of the adult population. Opinions are influenced by demographic factors such as education, economic status, religion, race, and, eth and ethnicity, gender, and geographic region. Most descriptions of public opinion are based on opinion polls, although, as I mentioned, too, there are focus groups and there are more detailed um, uh, surveys. Political culture is a set of attitudes about the country or government. So there's the American political culture, there's a German political culture, there's a Japanese political culture, and so forth. And there are certainly subcultures, like what we might see in Minnesota or among different communities within the United States. Uh, media performs the following key functions in a democracy. Of course, entertainment, news reporting, sometimes those things get blurred. Um, identifying public problems or agenda setting, socializing new generations, providing a political forum, and of course, making profit. Most media in the United States is for profit. And if they don't return um, on their shareholders investment, then they move in a different direction so that they can do that. The mainstream media is often accused of liberal bias, but of course, there's a lot more nuance when we take a look at um, that how people are um, receiving their news by radio and um, Fox News more than any other cable source. So it's not quite so simple. Um, okay, that pretty much does it. And here are your discussion questions for the week. You know the drill by now. One original post. Make sure to follow the grading rubric that's posted on D2Well and at least two responses to your classmates' post. Make sure you have something to add when you're responding to them. If you don't, Move on to a different question. Don't just simply say, well, I like what you said here. Indicate what you have to add. Always better to be able to draw on an example or a concept from the signed reading. As always, please reach out to me. Meet with me during Zoom hours. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns and have a great week.